Welcome to Challenging Paradigm X. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm too old to do this or to learn this? What does daily body work and practicing extreme flexibility do to your mind? And what could happen in your life if you dared to believe in yourself? Today my guest is Nina Buri. Nina is an exceptional entertainer and stage performer practicing the art of contortion. Contortion is an art that requires extreme physical flexibility, where the artists do feats of seemingly inhuman flexibility. She started at the age of 30, the age at which most contortionists stop performing this art. And please be aware, contortion is nothing that someone just performs as a hobby. The level of dedication and training it requires is comparable to the one of a high-performance athlete. Essentially, with what she achieved, her story is challenging many paradigms. Nina will let us dive into her past and tell us about her metamorphosis to what she calls becoming really herself. So basically how she turned from a Moulin Rouge ballet performer, who wasn't always self-confident, to one of the world's most prominent contortionists by overcoming all critical voices from the outside and by daring to do what she really believed in. And that, at an age, no one in the field would have imagined it to be still physically possible. Amongst other things, she became a finalist in America's Got Talent and recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award for her 35-year-long career on stage. Currently, she works as a stage performer, speaker, model, actress, and moderator. While being the oldest contortionist in the world who has set herself the goal of doing the split still at the age of 90. So, if you are interested in finding out how she achieved these feats, stay tuned. Hi, Xerxes, and I'm today with uh, Nina Buri. Nina, welcome to my podcast. Uh, please introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, Xerxes. I'm happy to be with you on this podcast. I'm a Swiss contortionist. I'm probably the oldest contortionist in this world right now. I'm 44 almost in August. I'm going to be 44. And I do this crazy contortion thing for about 14 years now. And um, before I was a ballet dancer, I danced all my life since the age of six. And I traveled the world for all my contracts and education. And yeah, I danced everywhere and I had a pretty moving life. All the time so i yeah i'm on the move uh, until corona happened and then of course we all slowed down a little yeah but my life is pretty bendy and flexible you can say that so you say since you're six you're dancing yes i started ballet dancing uh, when i was six years old i saw a, a musical show in a musical show and stage and i told my mother i want to do this i want to be on stage and she said if you want to be on stage you have to learn first something and we started with ballet i i didn't really know what ballet is by the time i just know knew that i i wanted to be on stage that's that was always the the main thing so i started ballet at seven around seven and then my first performance was three three years later in the same show which i saw at, at the age of six and since then i'm I have this virus inside of me, the, the dancing and stage virus. And maybe, yeah, this is a profession, not only a profession, but in German, we say Berufung, something you have to do. Calling, yeah. yeah. And I, I still love it because I think I have to love it so much to do that, that still, because it's very demanding for the body, the body work I do every day. Yes. So, I mean, basically when I count it right, you do it like stage performance for 35 years now. Yes, I just got the Lifetime Achievement Award for my skills and I thought, oh my God, I'm not that old. But when I think about it, I'm really old in what I do because contortionists are usually about 30 when they stop. And I started when I was 30 with contortion and that's a weird thing. And now I'm, I'm actually happy to have the honor to get that award. But I thought, okay, this is weird. <laughs> I always see or saw so far people that are 70, 80 years old at the end of their life and they get this award. But yeah, it's it's kind of special, you know. <laughs> oh, it is special. And please tell me, like, I mean, do I understand correctly, after 35 years, you had your first time kind of a break after 35 years. So you're ongoing for 35 years, you were always performing? 
I I didn't never do a break. I'm always performing, but Corona, of course, made us stop a little bit to do the stage work. But contortion is so demanding that you have to do it every day. You you need to, as, for the people that don't know what contortion is, it's actually extreme flexibility done with your body. You can imagine, like in Switzerland, they call me Schlangenfrau. Uh, translated, it's like snake woman. <laughs> so that means I'm the very flexible person. And in order to maintain that flexibility, you have to work out every day. That means home office is not a strange word for me because I do it every day at home. <laughs> and in Corona times, of course, we didn't have the chance to perform on stage, but still through internet or other, th other options, I could of course show my skills a little bit, but it was, it was still a little break from my usual crazy traveling life, which is leading or guiding me to from one show to the next. So Corona made it happen that it slowed down a little, which is also healthy to, to, not only to recover, but also to have some ideas, okay, where I am, where do I want to go? Especially in this time when I got one month ago, this lifetime achievement award, I thought, okay, can I get more high? I mean, in my career, is it possible to get more? Not really, but because I lived all the things already, but you can change because you change as a person a little bit and you have another approach on stage possibly and other impacts that come in the performance, which is very interesting. For example, voice working as a speaker connection in connection with my skills as an artist, transmitting some ideas. How do you work with your body in that age can also be interesting for certain people. You can be a role model, for example, because people always think when you are so old as I am, you cannot start something new or you, you are too old to do that, which is not true. You can always make progress. Um, that's th those are things that came to my mind only because of this break and yeah, it has always a pros and contras. <laughs> yes. So you you are thinking of going more into the direction of speaking and combining it with your stage performance? I don't plan it so fast or so far, but I uh, had done it already. And it's always interesting for the people, I realize. Because when I'm only doing my show, I'm an artist. I'm a contortionist. When I start to be a speaker or I speak, I use my voice, I reach the people on the other level. And when they then know how my career went or what my career was so far, which is different from all the normal careers, people normally are 18, they stop their uh, education as contortionists or as artists, and then they start to be on stage with that art. And maybe 10 or 20 years later, they finished. I started contortion only at 30. So in an age where nobody believed I can reach a level a good level, a professional level in contortion. This was my turning point. And there is sometimes a need in the audience to know that and to motivate young people, especially to not give up and not think when they are 18, they have done it all and they cannot reach any more new goals. Because some people tell me, Nina, I am 20 and now I'm too old, isn't it? And I say, no, who says you are too old? You can always go further and you can always try because at least do try, then you know, you know. So especially with your art, uh, like flexibility in the body. Yes. And do you, do you see a connection to flexibility in mind? A person in my age and in what I do, you have always to change because you, you know, the market is never stable. The market in, in, as an art, for an artist, for a circus performer, for a dancer, for an actor, we are not like this, like, uh, I show now a straight line. <laughs> you cannot see it maybe. So, uh, you are not nine to five, you are not having five weeks of holidays and then you have not the chance to recover this time and be paid. We have always ups and downs and we must know what is the need of the audience right now? What do they want? If my show is maybe not successful, why is it not successful? Can I change something? So you have to be very alert, like a snake. I mean, it fits, you know, you have to be alert. You have to know, is it good what I do? If it's running well, then maybe I do everything right. Or maybe I can change things and I have to question this, you know, and be open for changes. I cannot be here and say, no, what I did is, is good and it will always be good. It can be good, yes, on stage, but sometimes the market changes, so I have to adapt. For example, in this year, we learned that Zoom meetings are very important. When I would say, oh, no, I have not a laptop, I have no computer, I will never do that, then I would be still, stay, I do, do not move forwards anymore. I think you have to always have your eyes and ears open and your senses for the people, for the needs and for what's happening in the world in order to be a good artist and to be, to find your place in the system.
before you started your art, you were a ballet dancer. Your level of flexibility has been much lower than it was after. Or the actual question is, I, I'm I'm really interested in if you also found there was a change how your mind worked when you started with contortion. Okay, I always knew I'm flexible. Sometimes more flexible than normal dancers. This was my big issue. <laughs> Let's say it was not always a pro because by the time I was a ballet dancer, this kind of flexibility was not even asked. I mean, you have to have you had to have a certain flexibility, but technical aspects like turning, jumping were much more important in this time. When you had this flexibility, I was sometimes the only one and sometimes I could not even use it because the whole group was doing different. So I thought, okay, I know my skills, but I didn't really train it so much. But when I was a kid, and this is interesting, my first thing I did actually before I started ballet was card wheels in the garden, or I did the uh, acrobatics for myself, what I saw on television. I just copied that. I, I, played, I played circus, let's say that. So I was actually maybe a contortionist already before I even started ballet, but without knowing it consciously. And then I, I became a ballet dancer and I sometimes knew, okay, maybe I should be a soloist. Maybe I should do something that I have a solo role and I have to sell it then. But I knew only with dancing, that's really pretty difficult. So the, the, the thought to be a contortionist came because I knew I, I don't want to go on as a ballet dancer anymore at the age of 30. I knew, okay, either you stop or you, you do something that is really you. And that's why I looked in the internet, what kind of possibilities are there for doing an education as a contortionist? The, 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 the name contortionist was not even so much in my mind and not even a picture, but I knew flexibility and I knew acrobatics, something like that I want to do. And then suddenly everything went really quick. I found a school in China. I, I knew I can go there for longer than just two or three weeks in summer. I can study there for one year or two years. So I went there for six months and it's not that the teacher paid a lot of attention to me, but I, I watched the kids and I watched what they do and I learned and I told myself, I have to learn it. I have to do it now. I cannot disappoint myself and my people, which are actually not believing in me that I can do that still at the age of 30. So I thought, okay, I want to try. And I gave it a try. And when I came back, I was pretty much already a contortionist. That means I trained for six months, eight hours a day, and I transformed my body from ballet dancer into contortionist. Means I learned handstanding, which I never did as ballet dancer. And I learned this crazy overstretches of the legs and the back, which need to be done every day when you're a contortionist. And yes, it worked luckily because, you know, when you never did it, you cannot know how the body is going to react. Sometimes maybe people find out that try that like me, maybe they find out, oh no, I have always pain. I cannot do it. But luckily my body reacted very well. And so I, I knew I can do this and it gave me very much strength. And, and, and forced to do it. And I said, okay, I found my thing. And now I can invent shows because I'm now a soloist. I don't have to look after the others. I'm now a soloist. And of course the beginning was really hard. Nobody wanted to see my show first. So I had to really make sure they see me in festivals and stuff like that to be seen as a new me. Before I was known as a dancer, but now I had to be known as a circus artist. Yes. <laughs> so it took six months, this uh, metamorphosis basically. Yes, and of course, much longer. I mean, six months was just the beginning, but if you saw me after six months, you saw already the contortionist, you know? Of course, I, I, when I see videos now from this time, I was like, oh my God, everything is so slow. I had to be concentrated very much to do a handstand and to hold it. Now it's like nothing, like like my second shoes, you know? I, or how do you say that? It's, it's like, I natural. do it every day. It's, it's so much natural. It's so much inside of me that I basically, I can watch television with the training, I don't have to concentrate so much, except if I work on new stuff, of course. But then it was still a new thing. So concentration, a lot of warm up, a lot of preparation. Yeah, this was, uh, of course, like every new thing, it has to be first your second nature before you can shine on stage. So did also something change on your mind level, like in this process? I mean, it was a challenge, obviously, like um, and a decision, but did you, like looking back now, do you feel after six months or maybe one a year that you also have changed as a person? Yes, I was much more, how do you say that in English? I was not very self-confident before. 
as a dancer, I doubted it a lot. I was always like in question, is it the right thing? Teachers told me I'm not good enough. Uh, sometimes you didn't get the job. I was used to get a no, you know, and the problem was not the exterior no. The problem was sometimes my no, because I adapted it. And I said to myself, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I should be better. Maybe I should not be here and do that. You know, there was a lot of doubts because I felt somehow that I was not really on the, still not on the right place physically and inside. So I, I knew I have to first get my yes inside the yes saying I'm good enough. It's good. What I do, I have to be convinced to make sure the people are convinced what they see, you know, so I have to be convinced myself about what I'm doing. And of course this transformation happened really strongly from the moment I went there was a big question mark. Can I do it? Is it okay? Is it really as bad as everybody says, because they thought I'm stupid to do that because I was 30 already and I'm an old woman doing something crazy. So nobody was actually helping me. So I had to be very strong. So a lot of question marks, but inside of me, I kind of knew oh, this must be the right thing because I don't want to look for something new. This must be the right thing. And then after three months in the process, I felt, okay, I feel it's good. My body reacts well. I know I can shine in this when I work really hard and it was really much fun. I had no problems to, to, to work out eight hours a day. I had so much fun. It didn't feel like work. And maybe these components made it that I'm so happy about what I'm doing. that when I came back, I was another person, a self-confident person, which is happy and which show, which likes to show what she can and do and likes to impress people, which didn't believe in me in the first place. This gave me a lot, gave me a lot of motivation. Yeah, it was, it was like a big process from going there. The Nina starts to be in China. The Nina leaves China was a very big difference. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. It sounds like, like you, you believed in what you want to do and you, you were able to succeed. Yes. I believed when I knew after six, or let's say after three, four months that it starts to look pretty nice. What I do, I can make something with it. I don't have to be the best. I will never reach the level of a nine-year-old Chinese contortionist, but that doesn't matter because I knew what my, what my show should be. It should be a show with a theme. Like for example, I have this, this kind of famous James Bond act, which is still one of my best acts, just because people see in me the Bond girl and they are happy just for the music and the whole uh, environment that I create. And I knew after this yeah, it's, it's a little time actually after four months in the process that this is going to work, even if I didn't have the, the, the show in front of my eyes yet, but it gives you, it gives you so much confirmation that you get much stronger without having actually the people around you saying, yeah, you're strong because before I let myself lead from the voices a lot. People said to me, oh, it's bad. I believed it. I said, oh shit, I have to work more. Oh no, I'm not good enough. So you could make me a lot of, look, you could make me very uh, insecure. And when I knew I found this, this art of contortion, I knew I can leave ballet behind and just as a training, I like it, but ballet on stage behind, and I can start something that is probably now really me. And I think when somebody finds th the thing that is your thing, it's going to be easy. It's like in love when you have a relationship and it is always weird and some somehow you have to fight and I don't believe it's the right partner, you know? It doesn't mean that when you have the right partner, you never fight, but it means sometimes things coming together when you feel it's right now. And this feeling I had when I left China and uh, when I started, even when I didn't have a job yet, I felt confident that I have something to offer, which could be interesting for the people to see. Yeah. So it mm -hmm. must have been a very intense feeling, basically an intense uh, moment in your life. Yes, because you're in this country that you don't know, you don't speak the language. Nobody is on your side to say, oh, you're doing good. Everybody watches you strangely because you have to imagine I trained as a 30 year old with kids that are from nine to 12 years old and are much more flexible, are already professionals. And you feel like an old woman, really, literally again, right next to them. And yeah, this, 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 this is not really helping a lot to make sure you feel amazing what you do, because in the beginning you feel where you are and you are not yet there where you should be. But if your body is, is, is doing it, what you ask it, then it is, yeah, it gives you, it gives you the strength to, to go through that process and to say to yourself, anyway, I know where I am I'm not there yet, but I'm on a good way. I'm on the right road to success. Yes. 
it's very inspiring what you say because it's it sounds kind of for me i might be wrong of course but it sounds kind of for me that when you were six you had this dream of a ballet dancer and then you outgrew that dream when you were 30 going there so to, to china and 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 went on the next stage of of your life actually um it's not really correct i didn't know ballet yet I saw a stage performance and they did ballet as well, but it was kind of a musical performance. So the only thing I wanted really was on stage to be on stage. Mm. It was not particularly, I want to be a ballerina. I didn't even know what is ballet, but I of course then started ballet because a kid, as a kid, you cannot, where, do, where should you start? Usually you start with ballet or something like a basic. And yes, the ballet dream came really strong when I was 14 because I had to decide, okay, do I want to go on with this musical school with this, musical comedy school or is it do I have to change and I had to change the school because I was in a kind of not good school <laughs> then I knew at the age of 14 yes I want to be a ballet dancer and I knew it but I was technically not so good because I I missed a lot of technique the school didn't give th this technique to me they the ballet school I was attending was not really good so at 14 I realized I have to change school and learn a lot of things only at the age of 17 I became kind of a professional in my ballet education which is a really late age usually when I came I, I went to the ballet school in Berlin this is a professional state ballet school and I'm happy that they took me because actually they took me at the age of almost 18 which is the age usually you finish the school so I had three years to run after my skills and to learn what I didn't learn before and this was my ballet dream really I said to myself I have to make it I have to make it but maybe it was a little bit forced maybe I should be more relaxed in this time but at the same time I couldn't I, I absolutely wanted this ballet and I wanted to to run after the things I didn't learn yet I had to learn so much and yeah, this was my kind of like first big dream. And the second big dream was, yeah, the contortion. Yes, you're right. Or for, well, let's say first the stage, then the ballet, then the contortion. <laughs> yes. So maybe it was more kind of you discovered what really is your thing. Like Exactly. That's the process. Yes. That feels very strong because also you described before you were not so self-confident but yeah. when you come back you're so full of self-confidence you still don't have a show you still don't have the new audience people know you for something else but you are actually the way I understood it you didn't have a doubt is that correct of course there were doubts because when you send your video out to every director in this world and every theater and stuff and nothing really comes back except of one answer they say i want to try it with you and this was my ma first management then of course you think maybe i'm not yet there but i felt um, maybe when i changed my act which was pretty long the video i sent was about 10 minutes which is way too long and then it doesn't matter because you need only one person believing in you when you want to make it you don't need hundreds that love it you in the beginning one person is enough so this person i had and through her i got a job in a casino in portugal they wanted me as a contortionist but they said nina we love you but your act is pretty slow can you maybe do something that fits more casino you know and <laughs> this was the point that i thought okay casino i have three days to make a number what i do in this time was james bond casino royale very popular and i said oh casino Maybe I should be a Bond girl. <laughs> the second thought was, which music can I take? So I did a, connect, coll a collection of musics from popular James Bond to Tina Turner, Golden Eye. And then I said, okay, Golden Eye, my costume must be golden. <laughs> so this, this act was pretty fast that I invented it. And it's weird. I think it was the most successful ever in this short time I did this act. And since then I went to festivals with it and this was the point where it started to be successful because I had the right act for my skills and for what I could offer in this time. And I think by then I got confidence because first time in my life, I was awarded with some festival prizes and stuff like that, which never happened as a dancer. As a dancer, I was always running after my technique and stuff like that. And I was pretty like, oh my God, maybe I'm not that bad, you know, so it could, could work. And then Yes, one came after the next. So I knew I'm in the right place. Now I'm in the right place and in the right métier, you say in English or in, in French, the contortion is good for me. So this was actually the proof when it started to work because I had the right act to offer to the people. So mm. yeah, kind of the confirmation that yes, thoughts, yes. what would, would uh, bring you on to this path. Okay, I like continue this path to the where, where it's now.
I think um, for everybody that wants to make it somehow, you have to analyze very strongly what do I have to offer and what the people want. If this comes together and it fits, then you have success. If you have a great thing to offer and nobody wants it or knows it, you cannot have success. Or if some people want something else from you that you cannot offer, you will also not have success. So it has to be really that you analyze a little bit. Okay, I want to do this. I can do this. What, what, what is the offer I have? And you make a little package which you have to sell. Otherwise, nobody knows it. Nobody will buy you. And this is actually the business, which is sad. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm such a good contortionist or I'm such a good whatever lawyer and stuff, but nothing works. So that means there is one component in the process that is not yet there where it should be. Or, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you found the sweet spot in the casino when they ask you between what you can do and uh, what is asked of you. And then you had only a few days time and you to make sure I had a good right, right offer for them or the right act that they are happy that otherwise I would have not have the job because they said to me, we like you, but we cannot take you with that act you have with that number. And that means I said, yeah, yeah of course I have another act, which is not true. <laughs> I just invented it by the time they asked me. And then I sent the video two days later saying, this is my act. I'm a Bond girl. And then they said, oh, this is great. This fits our casino. And then it started to work, actually. Yes. The, the, the jobs, the, the requests. Yeah. Okay, great. What would you call the turning point of, of, of in this whole story? Is it China or was it in the casino or was there other turning points that were really important for you? The big confirmation and for me, an unbelievable thing happened when I did a casting show on the TV. This was two years after this James Bond act. And I had pretty much experience then by then because I did that James Bond number a lot. And then came a request from Swiss television. Nina, do you want to join Switzerland Got Talent? And I was like, <sighs> by this time, it was a little bit not good for us artists to do it. We said amongst each other, we said, oh no, casting shows are not good for us. We should not do it. We are professionals and not... Yes. But I said to myself, a casting show can be a big chance to be seen by a lot of people which are never actually touching the circus or never touching the, our industry. And I just said, let's see. I just do it. I cannot lose anything. So I uh, signed in and I tell, told them, yeah, I'm going to come. And they, they gave me a date to perform. And then I did that. And I was really not good at that, at that day. I, I, I felt almost sick because I had another show and I was like, should I go or not? But luckily I did it because this was actually my most success. I can say I went second in this, in this whole competition, I, uh, second place. And in the end, it doesn't really matter if you win or not because people have seen you so many times and either they love you or they don't, but you have a big audience. And I think this was also the first time that I had, let's say my backpack was ready. I had a lot of skills in my backpack. My will to, to go out there and show my stuff was, was ready. And my performance was ready to, to make sure I can now do my show professionally around the world. And the, I, I, the reason I say that is the winner in this show was a singer, an opera singer. She was actually a bus driver singing opera, like an angel, really good. But she was unfortunately not ready. She was winning and then was kind of like, oh, what happens? And by the time she wake up of this dream, the, the demand after her was already over. So when you do this show, you have a chance. And I think this was a turning point in, because I used to this chance. I went there, I did it, and it was a success. And this was the first time I had this really proof also, ah, people like what I do. The normal people like it. And then, um, yeah, it, it can give you so much, so much or, or not. I can, when I see the winner now, she's still looking for her way to go, but, but she had all the things actually. She had it all, but she didn't realize what to do with it. Every chance that comes along the way can be a chance to jump on the, on the, on the train and drive fast but you have to do it. And also this was a time when people told me, no, you should not do a casting show. It's maybe not good. Maybe they, they make sure they, they laugh about you or something like that. I said, I have to make sure I know, you know, otherwise I, I, I will always ask myself if it will be the right thing. And, and I'm happy I did it because then I knew it was the right thing for me to do. And this was this turning point where let's say my art, which is an art usually known by circus performers, which are Chinese people. You see it only in circus. I think I helped in Switzerland a little bit to make sure that we art as artists are seen as, as popular entertainment that you can book for galas, events. And yeah, 
this is, is a good feeling that you can do something for your people also. Usually only singers were winning this show and I was always winning as a contortionist, which is which is cool for us circus performers. Yeah. And so when was that approximately? 2011, uh, 10 years yeah. ago, actually, 10 years, 10 years ago. ago. Yes. So it was like, like three, four years into your career. I left China in 2008. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Four years after or okay. three years later. And then yeah. what was, I mean, again, you did this the second time at least so the second time that i hear it that everyone tells you no don't do this it's not good for you or you know not going to be successful or whatever it was now in the certain situation and you still did it what 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 drove you to make this decision i knew i can offer on the tv television something very cool which switzerland doesn't know yet and i didn't want to wait for somebody else doing it so I, what holds me back to do it i don't have a reason my manager was just what was just very shy that's why she said hmm, maybe you should wait maybe you should not do it maybe uh, it could be a bad experience well if you think like that you should never you should not even go on the on the street because it could be a bad experience crossing a street you maybe a car comes <laughs> so i was convinced okay i i just felt this inner voice says to me i should do it and was not bad to listen to it since 2008 so i thought i have to do it you know and yeah. then the funny thing is when i became second place a year later my manager two years later she was not my manager anymore but she sent all the people that she manages to do the show because she thought nina made it so you guys have to make it too yeah. but which is a little bit rid ridiculous because everyone is not the same person so some people don't want to do this don't want to have exposure like this in front of a jury which is not even professional the jury doesn't know about circus of course you should know for yourself if it's the right thing i don't recommend it for everyone so yeah so what do you think like you've experienced a lot of things and you're a high performer in your art and do something very special and i believe that People like you, they can can translate what their art is into other areas of life. So into other aspects of anyone who's high performing in what they do. You can learn from them. Mm -hmm. When it comes to when you see your friends who are not artists, for example, or people that are not artists from all walks of life, could be from business, it could be from politics, it could be from anything. What what do you think it is that you as an individual? can share from your story but also from 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 your art what can other people learn from it daring things daring to to believe in you and your skills and not always listen to everybody else because sometimes your inner voice is very strong and very or also also silent but it's, it's there and people they have all the apps on their phones and they tell the apps tell them what to do every single day but i believe there is another as other side which is the side go inside of you and listen what is there because there's so many things and we this inner voice and this this guidance so we rather learn uh, rather go to the doctor giving us pills to do to re uh, recover from something instead of saying okay why did this happen you know like questioning things and and i yes things not only blind doing what everybody else says but also a little bit step back and reflect you know and then you know it's usually the answer but sometimes you you don't trust your your strength and that you can do it or so so i think i can teach the, those people that are normal people or people in normal jobs with my experiences a little bit more to do that you talk a lot now about inner voice. Is there a specific methods how you cultivated it in the past? Or is it something that you just had inside of you? I, when I start my training, when I start my training now, I'm very much like excited <laughs> because I had so many things happening in one day that first of all, everything is my, in my brain, okay? My training takes about three to four hours, which sounds a lot, but it's a lot of training, like very slow training. So it's not like a sprint or something. That means from these big things in my head, I transfer my, my thoughts a little bit into energy that goes into my body. And then I feel very much connected. That means people nowadays, they sit all day, they go home and they sit because they eat their, uh, their dinner. They go in front of the television, they still sit and still only nourish their brains. And I think we have to learn to more go into our bodies and discover things because when I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of maybe also negative thoughts or negative or positive, doesn't matter. And a lot of things, oh, Nina, you have to do this and that. Oh, tomorrow is that day. Oh, tomorrow is that. 
then suddenly you have to start a little bit breathing and calm down. And people normally do that with alcohol or a cigarette or going out with friends. But this is still an aspect that comes ex exterior, exterior entertainment, or you you do some you, you do not something good for your body. But when you move, when you start learning about your body, let's say example is yoga, a good example. Um, I think then you can discover much more what your body tells you. It sounds a little bit esoteric, but it's really, really true. I'm not the same person when I start my training as when I end my training. I'm very calm and sometimes 50% of the things I was busy with in my head in the beginning of my training are not even important anymore because I know tomorrow is another day. I can do it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and I know also when I did my training, what my skills are, and this gives me a lot of strength to say, hmm, I have my skills. This is okay. It's enough. <laughs> yeah. And so kind of you bring from your head, everything goes down into your body. And at the same time, the, your self-confidence again rises through the. Yes. The it's con it, it makes you calmer. That's why I recommend moving that people should dance. They should go show to do joggings in the, in the woods or whatever things that do you do for yourself and your body. I think this can help a lot to, to calm down and to, to forget, not to not forget, but that things that you're busy with, that you make your energy stop maybe because your energy is very tense sometimes in your job, that you can calm down and, and a little bit more relax because everything I do when I'm not relaxed, I cannot bend my body or fold my body as I do. When I'm very much in tension in the first hour of my training, I could not, I'm not the same as in the fourth hours where, where I'm very soft. And this, go, this softness goes from the brain into the, into the legs and into everywhere, everywhere. So it's very important to that process. It doesn't have to be four hours a day for a normal person, of course. Some people call it meditation. They sit there and they go inside themselves and they breathe. But I have to experience that a lot of people cannot do that because they even more have brain thoughts than when they do that and sit there and are even more in tension because they think, oh, I'm just sitting here, do nothing. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to teach somebody that is never doing something with its body to go there but i just say try try some sports that you like that you can see the difference you basically went on to this new path 13 years ago 14 years ago yes and just imagine yourself now in 13 years from now looking back <laughs> at uh, the pandemic and what it changed for you in your life and it also sounded a bit like you are now also perhaps moving on to a next stage in your life, in your career. So if you imagine yourself 13 years from now, thinking of this time, 2020, the pandemic, you calmed down, 2021, from that perspective, what do you think has changed? Oh my God. I hope in 13 years, I have found something that is, of course, less physical and still making me very happy body work will always be involved in my life that's for sure i cannot live without moving but of course not in the extent that not in the in the amount i'm doing it now because now four hours a day is a full profession and uh performing i give myself i always plan for two years two more years that means i left i, I lost a lot already one and a half a year with the corona crisis pandemic so i hope that i can do this for till 45 healthy and happily then I hope I can still be on stage, but maybe with a little bit more other aspects like talking, speech, speeches, speaker, a host. I have a, an offer as a, for a host job in television from Switzerland, which is very interesting. So I'm going to maybe present, it's not sure yet, but I'm going to maybe present cultural themes. This could be a, a way to go that is very interesting for me to, to bring the art I'm actually living now to the people. What happens? What, what, what can they see every single day? Is it music? Is it theater? Something like that. And yeah, in 13 years, I hope uh, I'm still happy with my, my, my boyfriend or my husband. And uh, I'm going to look back and say I'm an established woman in whatever I, I love to do. Because I think that's the most important, to love what you do. doesn't matter what it is. Yes. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you've talked a lot about paradigms already in a way throughout our conversation. Is there any other paradigms that you want to add that you think need to be challenged? So definitely you talked about what people believe in that they can achieve at a certain age and things like that. But is there when it comes to the body, the mind or other aspects of life, basically, that you feel like 
people really should challenge these paradigms that we have in society, in the world? I think everything, every change has to start uh, somewhere, but I think we should, as, an, as, a, as, a, as people, every country we should start with the kids. Kids are nowadays not moving anymore and it starts, the problems start there already. They are not well balanced inside their bodies. They're already like too much with their energy. They cannot go anywhere because they don't move. Uh, they have to sit in class all day long learning things, but where is the, where is the gymnastic class or to move? And I think we have to find a way that the program for these kids is already so well balanced that as when they are adults, that they know about their bodies as much that, as they know mathematics or languages. And I always say, I always say, hey, do you know any politician that knows to do a handstand? And people are, ah, of course not. I say, yes, of course not. Why? Because they should do a handstand every single day. This is the same, this is the same skill level that you should have, like the brain. And I think this could be an aspect that we should work on to educate the people in a way that they get back to their bodies at a very early age. And we, we could avoid a lot of violence in this world. A lot of people that are, don't know where to go with their energy, don't have a goal in their life. I think when you move your body, you suddenly maybe have a hobby. You suddenly maybe go to football class or do you go to gymnastics or you go to ballet, whatever it is. You have a goal maybe and, and, uh, and something that guides you. I see a lot of kids, they, have those, they don't have that anymore, especially through the Corona crisis and pandemic they lost completely where they want to go. And this is very dangerous. I think this is more dangerous than having Corona to not know what's going on in my life. Where do I want to go? Am I actually worth anything? And all these questions should, as we as a population should work very hard on that in the future. My final question, I always like to ask, um, you look back, not now from th 13 years from now, but uh, 100 years from now, maybe not you, but your children or grandchildren. <laughs> And uh, when they talk about you, so what, what do you want people to remember you for? Okay, maybe she showed to the world that at the age of 90, you can still do a split and you can still do a bridge. <laughs> she showed the world that it's never too late to move your body and to believe in your skills and your dreams. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. It was a very inspiring conversation. And, Thank you. Uh, I wish you a great day. You too. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for staying tuned for this edition of Challenging Paradigm X. If you like this episode with Nina Buri, feel free to share it with your community so Nina's message gets spread even further. In the show notes, you will find the links to her work. Please hit subscribe and rate my podcast if you liked it. I'd be also very glad if you write me a review. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me. Next week, we're up with the next edition of Challenging Paradigm X. Until then, I wish you a great week.